Once again, I'd like to welcome Father Ronnie Marie to St. Joseph's. Um, Father Ronnie Marie, as uh, some of you, all of you may know, is a priest who was ordained last August in the Latin Church. However, um, he is Maronite. <laughs> he's Maronite and he's from Kfrizghob. So you can't get more Maronite than Kfrizghob. <laughs> so um, we welcome him uh, today here at St. Joseph's. Um, Father Ronnie Marie, if you were here at Mass, he was, he was telling everyone that he has many memories of this church because as he was growing up, Monsignor Shora Marie, who's his uncle, was the parish priest here and he used to come with his family every single Sunday, he used to sit over here next to the door. So um, St. Joseph is always uh, home, I guess, to, to many of us. Um, and Father Tony was here yesterday and he was speaking about his experience at St. Joseph. I know I've had my own very beautiful experiences here in my journey, my vocation. So St. Joseph has had a wonderful effect and a wonderful, um, uh, he's a wonderful example for us all. So let's um, listen to what Father uh, Ronnie Marie has to say about St. Joseph during this year of St. Joseph so that we can become more like St. Joseph in our day-to-day -day life. I'll leave it with Father Ronnie. Thank you, Father Danny. Thanks once again for your welcome and uh, to be in the church of my patron saint as well. I'm Ronnie Joseph, named after my grandfather and my dad, so St. Joseph has always been my close guardian. We'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Saint Joseph, whose protection is so great, so strong, so prompt before the throne of God, I place in you all my interests and desires. O Saint Joseph, do assist me by your powerful intercession and obtain from, for me from your divine Son all spiritual blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that having experienced here below your heavenly power, I may offer my thanksgiving and homage to the most loving of fathers. O Saint Joseph, I never weary of contemplating you and Jesus asleep in your arms. I dare not approach while he reposes near your heart. Hold him close in my name and kiss his fine head from me and ask him to return the kiss when I draw my dying breath. Saint Joseph, patron of departing souls, pray for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The title of our reflection tonight is Saint Joseph, Vulnerability and Obedience. Saint Joseph, Vulnerability and Obedience. These two great qualities that stand out in Saint Joseph's life as we move through and look at him. And we're going to split our reflections up tonight into three sections. Saint Joseph, Vulnerability and Obedience in the Past. Saint Joseph, Vulnerability and Obedience in the Present. And Saint Joseph, Vulnerability and Obedience in the Future. So in the past, the Holy Father, Pope Francis and Saint Joseph have a particularly strong and close relationship. It's written that in 1953 in Buenos Aires, in Saint Joseph's church, the Holy Father as a 17 year old discovered his vocation. And it was in a moment there that he knew what he wanted to do for God. And in 2013, 60 years later, on March the 19th, on the Feast of St. Joseph, he was inaugurated at his first Mass as Holy Father. And this continued devotion has given us the gift of this year, the gift of Saint, the year of St. Joseph, to get to know him better, to grow in devotion and in our imitation of him. And Pope Francis continues, continues this devotion to St. Joseph in his personal study. In his personal study, he has a statue of the sleeping Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph asleep. And he's had this very same statue since he was rector in the Jesuit seminary in San Miguel. 
the statue of the sleeping Saint Joseph. And the Holy Father explained, and has explained in a few interviews, his devotion to Saint Joseph asleep. And many of us would be aware of the pious practice of writing down our intentions, our wishes, our prayer requests, and placing them under the sleeping Saint Joseph and have him sleep on it, have him rest on it, where he's closest to God. Sleep is really the ultimate act of trust. It's the time where we don't do anything. We repose, we rest in the Lord. The ultimate act of trust. And uh, after I was ordained uh, in August 2019, I went on a trip around Europe and Lebanon with Monsignor Shora and uh, we were going through Italy and everywhere you went, there were statues of the sleeping St. Joseph. In all the tourist shops, in all the gift shops, uh, they were everywhere. Uh, It's a little bit like uh, following uh, your favorite sportsman or a famous person, you have to imitate them. So everybody thought, oh, well, the Pope has sleeping St. Joseph, everyone buy one. I remember when I was a kid, Hazem El Masri had a certain kicking tea, so my brother and I had to have that kicking tea. It was like that in Rome. Pope Francis has a sleeping St. Joseph, everyone needs one. And they were everywhere, every possible shop you can find. This beautiful devotion. St. Joseph is often depicted holding the lily. It comes from scripture. Hosea 14.5, he shall blossom like the lily. Speaking about the just and righteous man. St. Joseph is often depicted as the carpenter. His trade. St. Joseph is often depicted, depicted as husband and father. With Mary or holding Jesus. And in Our artwork behind the altar here, we have all three of those depictions all in one. Joseph holding Jesus and the lily in his workshop. But the sleeping St. Joseph isn't as common. But it's more biblical. Straight from the Gospels. The most information we have about about Joseph is when he's sleeping. All the most critical moments, all the most standout moments... All the most significant moments in the life of St. Joseph we have recorded in the Gospel involve him being asleep. St. Joseph being asleep and dreaming. And it's very interesting to note, at all these moments, at all these critical moments, when Joseph takes center stage in the story of the Holy Family, in the story of Mary and Jesus, they're also a time of deep crisis, deep vulnerability, trouble, times when the Holy Family are most challenged, times when the Holy Family are most vulnerable, the times when the Holy Family are open to attack, they're vulnerable to destruction, forces outside of them that are seeking to subvert their mission and the mission of God. The sleeping moments of St. Joseph's life are the most critical. And we're going to go through them. The first one is in Matthew 1, 18 to 25. So it says, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had born a son, and he called his name Jesus. 
Joseph was resolved to do away with Mary. He was resolved to divorce her, to send her away. Joseph had made up his mind to leave Mary as a single mother and to therefore leave her vulnerable and her unborn divine son vulnerable to stoning by death. The Holy Family, in that earliest, most crucial moment, was on the brink of destruction. If Joseph refused, who knows what would have happened to our Blessed Mother. But Joseph falls asleep, he dreams, and in that dream he hears the will of God. In the most vulnerable, critical, challenging time for the Holy Family, they're on the brink of destruction. St. Joseph, while he's sleeping, hears the will of God. And he not only hears it, he wakes up and follows it. And Joseph's obedience saves the day. Joseph's obedience ensures the Holy Family remains safe. Joseph's obedience mean God, means God, God's mission continues. The Second Vatican Council, quoting St. Paul, said, the greatest thing we have to do as, Christ in Christians, as Christians is to respond to God in the obedience of faith. To hear his word and to give ourselves totally and completely to him in the obedience of faith. And that's exactly what St. Joseph does. The Holy Family is incredibly vulnerable, but St. Joseph's obedience overcomes that challenge. It's very interesting. Once St. Joseph makes that decision, we hear that the scriptures are fulfilled. The plan of God continues. Joseph says, yes, I'll take Mary as my wife. And then straight away it says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. A virgin will conceive and bear a son. That God has his plan it's unfolding and Joseph's obedience is part of that plan. Joseph's obedience allows that plan to continue, to come to fruition. It's very interesting to note that Jesus would have, as he grew up, watched this obedience of Joseph and learnt to obey the Father through Joseph. When Jesus obeyed the heavenly father, he was imitating his earthly father, living that obedience. So Joseph asleep, the holy family vulnerable, but Joseph's obedience saves the day. That's the first dream. The second dream, Matthew 2, 13 to 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there till I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. And he rose and took his child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. It's the same thing again. The Holy Family is vulnerable. The Holy Family is in danger. The Holy Family is struggling. This time through the murderous rage of Herod, seeking to destroy Jesus seeking to destroy the Holy Family and God's plan for that family. And it's a critical touch-and-go moment. If Joseph makes a wrong step, Herod might get his way. But sleeping, obedient, Joseph saves the day again. And he doesn't wake up and take up arms and fight Herod off. He doesn't wake up and politically maneuver Herod out of his position and save his family like that. 
He doesn't wake up and use his particular skills and talents to fight off the danger. And God doesn't save the Holy Family in their vulnerability by taking away all challenges and removing any obstacles to growth or removing any danger. He saves them through his obedience, through following the word of God. In the same pattern again, because he did that, what happens? The scriptures are fulfilled. God's plan continues on. It says, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Joseph's obedience once again leading to the mission, the plan, the fulfillment of God's saving design. God used the sleep and the obedience that followed Joseph's sleep to outfox and to outmaneuver the forces of evil. He didn't destroy them by clicking his fingers. He didn't pretend that there was no danger or evil in the world. He didn't choose and will to remove every obstacle. But he asks for an intimate personal response and he'll use that response to outfox and outmaneuver evil. Two more dreams, very quickly. Matthew 2. When Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus reigned over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in the fourth dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. That what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called Nazarene. Dreams again, obedience again, the scriptures being fulfilled again. God winning, God being successful. This time it's a little different. We can think Joseph's obedience is meant to turn him into a robot. God just programs a plan for him into his dream and then just sends him off and Joseph mindlessly just, you know, takes part in the plan. We can think Joseph's obedience is God's just moving him around like a chess piece, like a plaything, you know, seeking to sort out his saving plan, like Joseph's something to use. But we hear that St. Joseph made decisions without hearing a dream. He used his own intellect. He discerned. He was afraid. He understood within himself what needed to be done. He knew that Herod's son was still in charge. So he knew wisely and he discerned that it wouldn't be good to go back to that area. So he goes back to another place. And then the angel comes and confirms in a dream that he's done the right thing. And it ends in the scriptures being fulfilled. Joseph was a wise, discerning man. And obedience involves this. Obedience involves wise discernment. God doesn't sort out every detail for us. God doesn't give us a full-blown instruction manual on what we have to do every single minute of our life, every tiny decision that we have to make. God often leads it up to us. He places the direction of his mission in our hands, in the little decisions that we make, and he knows he's in charge, he knows he's following And he'll either confirm those decisions or he'll tell us, hey, maybe you took the wrong step. Obedience doesn't tell us to throw our minds out, doesn't tell us that we don't have to make our own decisions, doesn't tell us to not be wise and discerning. The both work together. Pope Francis says that when God doesn't let out every detail for St. Joseph in his life, St. Joseph needs his imagination 
to sort out the rest of the details. He needs his basic human knowledge, which is a gift from God itself, to make a good decision. This has to do with the whole of the incarnation as well. The whole of Jesus becoming man. The conception of Jesus is a divine work. It's God's work which surpasses all human understanding and possibility. It's God's doing. His his action. But God intimately involves Joseph and Mary in his action. It's all him but they have a part to play. St. John Chrysostom speaking about this, that the incarnation, Jesus becoming man, was all God. He says, don't think, he's speaking to St. Joseph, don't think this divine work has nothing to do with you. I associate you intimately with the one who is to be born. The Holy Family vulnerable, Joseph obedient. The plan of God being fulfilled. Joseph's obedience, his actions in the Gospels, the sleeping Saint Joseph who wakes up and follows the word of God, fulfills the type, fulfills the shadow, fulfills the prophecy of Joseph from the book of Genesis, Joseph in the Old Testament. We hear that Joseph is sold by his brothers Jealous of him, hateful of him, they send him down to Egypt. They sell him to Ishmaelites and he ends up in Egypt. But he ends up in Pharaoh's house. And it says in Genesis, Joseph found favor in the sight of Pharaoh because he was a very successful guy. And Pharaoh made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. And St. Joseph, uh, not St. Joseph, sorry, St. Joseph, the patriarch from the Old Testament, begins to have more dreams. And he has a dream that Egypt and the whole world is going to go through a famine. So he says to Pharaoh, we've got to do something about this. We've got to start storing up bread and grain so that our people won't die. We're going to go through a great crisis. We're going to go through a great challenge. Egypt is going to be very vulnerable but we need to do something about it. And Pharaoh says, yeah, build the silos, start storing the grain, prepare for the famine. And St. Joseph becomes the protector of the bread. Joseph becomes the protector of the bread that saves Egypt and saves Israel. The famine hits, the whole world, it says in Genesis, is looking for bread. And only Joseph in Egypt had it. It says, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain. And his brothers ended up in Egypt. The ones who sold him, the ones who were jealous, the ones who sent him down there, they come to Egypt and they don't know where Joseph is, but he reveals himself to them and says, don't worry, don't worry, God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and keep alive many survivors. And it's through Joseph in Egypt, working and planning in a time of deep crisis and vulnerability and challenge, that Israel is saved, that God's promise is fulfilled, and the people of Israel continue their history. If it wasn't for Joseph, things would have looked very bad. God used him. And Joseph says to his brothers, come down to Egypt, I'll provide for you. There are still yet five more years of famine to come. The challenge doesn't go away, the crisis doesn't go away, but come down here, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. The Old Testament Joseph is used by God to protect his people in famine. Joseph, in the New Testament, guards the heavenly bread. Guards the heavenly bread that will feed the whole world. 
for eternal life. God's the heavenly bread in a time of crisis that will give life to the whole world through the Eucharist. Will give eternal life. That's St. Joseph, vulnerability and obedience in the past. St. Joseph, vulnerability and obedience in the present. The conflict that we see that Joseph has to come up against and contend with as the head of the Holy Family in those beginning stages of Jesus' life is only just the beginning of the conflict that Jesus would have to put up with his entire mission, his entire life. The conflict, the hostility, the opposition, even the open warfare, they were all continually part of the mission of Jesus. All through the gospel, there's a great battle going on between the divine power of salvation brought to earth through Jesus and the worldly power of evil that this divine power has come to threaten. In the early stages, we see that fight with Herod and all those who wanted to see Jesus dead. But that fight goes on throughout the whole gospel. And it's not forceful resistance that helps Jesus through these difficulties. It's not fighting back it's not through any worldly means that he fights this conflict. He fights it in nonviolent obedience. The fight goes all the way to the cross. Sacrificing himself on the cross is where Jesus, in obedience to the Father, wins the battle. The attack, the danger, the conflict, the trouble that was part of the life of Christ will always be part of the life of his body. The conflict, the attack, the danger, the vulnerability that was part of the life of Jesus will always be part of his church. We're on rough seas towards heaven. We're on a battleship, not a cruise ship. We're going through trouble. We're going through difficulty. And we may think that trouble and difficulty only belongs to our time, but it's always part of the church. It's always part of the church because it's always part of Christ. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Some people say we should add one to that. We believe in one holy, Catholic, apostolic and persecuted church. That it's sort of like the fifth marker of the church. That wherever you find persecution, there you'll find the church. There's a certain vulnerability to danger, to evil, to difficulty in following Christ. It's certain. Listen to some of these quotes. Now therefore, when in these most troublesome times the church is beset by enemies on every side and is weighed down by calamities so heavy that ungodly men assert that the gates of hell have at length prevailed against the church. Sounds like a pretty rough time for the church could be describing today. It's Pope Pius IX in 1870. Another one. Now, venerable brethren, you know the times in which we live. Listen to the times that this person's talking about. You know the times which we live. They are scarcely less deplorable for the Christian religion than the worst days, which in time past were most full of misery to the church. We see faith, the root of all Christian virtues, lessening in many souls. We see charity growing cold. The younger generation daily growing in depravity of morals and views. 
the church of Jesus Christ attacked every side by open force or by craft, and the very foundations of religion undermined with the boldness which waxes daily in intensity. Could be describing 2021 in the Western world. Do we think that that situation is unique to our time? Do we think that the rest of the church had it easy, there was a golden age and we're struggling? That was Pope Leo XIII writing in 1889. Vulnerability, challenge, crisis, danger and conflict is always part of the life of the church. Things were bad for the Holy Family. Things have always been bad in a sense and things are bad now. The things that, uh, that Pope Leo XIII spoke about, we can say that it's about our time now, our society, our culture. We must reflect honestly and seriously on the vulnerability and trouble we find ourselves in. In our church, there's increasing ignorance. Thanks be to God, in our Maronite church in Australia, we're full of life, increasing things thanks be to god are well we have many faithful families but that's not the same that's rare in the western world the numbers of people practicing is declining everywhere we are unique in our maronite diocese in australia the state of catholic education the state of life of many parishes in the world Think of the vulnerability of the world at the moment. Put on the news, things seem to be going mad. No one can have a sane and sensible conversation about anything. The most basic things of human life, gender, marriage, sexuality and the family are up for grabs. Materialism is the silent, unspoken of God. That's directing society, directing life and culture. And the very fundamentals, the very basics of what built Western civilization is being thrown out in no time. In the church, we're struggling. In the world, we're struggling. Individuals are struggling. We don't have to list all the many ways individuals struggle. We know them ourselves, we know them in our families, we know them in our communities, in our friends. That's not to make us feel overwhelmed. That's not to make us feel depressed. That's not to make us feel bad. Because the good news is we have the Saviour. And the good news also is that Joseph was the defender of the Holy Family then. He was the defender of the Divine House then. And he's the defender and guardian of the Divine Family now. We are part of the Holy Family That small nuclear family of three people has grown to billions and billions all through history, through the centuries. And St. Joseph is just the defender now for us as he was for them, providing for our safety and survival. God wills for Joseph to continue in his protection over that limitless family that covers the whole earth. And God entrusted his most precious treasures, his most precious, tongue-tied, precious treasures to St. Joseph. That vocation did not end when he died. His holy church is part of that treasure. We are resting in the arms of St. Joseph, our heavenly protector. Devotion to him is necessary. Promoting to devotion to him is necessary. To honour him, particularly in this year of St. Joseph, to deepen our relationship and to help everyone else deepen their relationship with St. Joseph. Because St. Joseph is like God. He's not going to force himself on us. But if we ask him, he will defend us through all that trouble. All that bad news that I listed all that trouble, all the way we think the church and the world is falling apart, 
the quiet, sleeping St. Joseph is ready to help. Ready to help. The words of Pharaoh in Genesis give us our motto. Pharaoh, the evil one, not always, but often depicted as, as an evil one in the scriptures. What does Joseph, Pharaoh says to his people? Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. Go to Joseph. We've put that all over our churches. That's the motto, the words of Pharaoh, a pagan. The church has taken those words and we've used them for our relationship with our father, Joseph. Go to Joseph. In time of difficulty, in time of famine, in time of trouble, in time of crisis, in vulnerability, go to Joseph. That's what he's there for. Thanks be to God for Father Don Calloway and the beautiful book, The Consecration to St. Joseph. It's given me a bit of material for tonight. In one beautiful chapter, Saviour of the Saviour, a title for St. Joseph. Sounds a little bit odd. Jesus can't have a Saviour. There's nothing really. A Saviour frees you from sin. Jesus had no sin. But Father Don, quoting Blessed William Joseph Shanamag, says... To give life to someone is the greatest of all gifts. To save a life is the next. Who gave life to Jesus? It was Mary. Who saved his life? It was Joseph. Ask St. Paul who persecuted him. St. Peter who denied him. Ask all the saints who put him to death. But if we ask who saved his life, be silent patriarchs, be silent prophets, be silent apostles, confessors and martyrs, let St. Joseph speak, for this honour is his alone. He alone is saviour of the saviour. He alone is saviour of the saviour. And Father Don writes, St. Joseph saved Jesus from Herod. St. Joseph protected Mary from robbers. St. Joseph consoled Jesus and Mary, prepared them for Calvary. St. Joseph was in the hearts of Jesus and Mary at Calvary. St. Joseph, your spiritual father, wants to protect you, prepare you, console you, and help make you and your life a sacrifice for others. The saints are our great intercessors. They're our great protectors. They pray for us, but they're also our models. We're not only meant to pray to Joseph, we're meant to imitate him. Join him in his vocation. Vulnerability, danger, persecution, trouble is part of the economy of salvation. It's part of God's plan. But we think, Pope Francis says, we think God works through our better parts. God works through our successes. But most of his plans are realised in in despite of our frailty, our weakness. Joseph needs protectors, needs sharers, sorry, in protecting Jesus and Mary. Joseph needs helpers in protecting Jesus and Mary. They are entrusted to us for care and safekeeping just like they were entrusted to Joseph. Joseph is a great patron of priests because priests are entrusted with the Eucharist. They're entrusted to protect it. They're entrusted to promote Jesus' presence in the Eucharist and to give him to the faithful. But we all share, we all share in protecting Jesus and Mary. We all share in protecting Christ and his church, its truth, its teachings, its life. From whatever enemy it comes across. If we, who are close to Jesus and Mary, do not defend them in the world, who will? If we do not stand up for them, 
when people are trying to dismantle the teachings of the church, when people are trying to speak that faith is not important, when people try and say that the church is silly, its sacraments are not needed, the scriptures are useless, their attacks on Jesus and Mary. We are called to stand up. And to stand up like Joseph. We're not called to stand up and, you know, fight with our own strength. We're not called to stand up and try and take on evil ourselves. We're called to stand up and fight through obedience. That's how we win. Our faithfulness will see God's mission fulfilled. Our trusting, loving obedience, staying faithful to God no matter what, no matter what struggle or difficulty we're going through, of cherishing His church, cherishing His scriptures, His commandments, and everything He's given us, that will ensure we stand up and protect Christ in Our Lady. We are in times of deep trouble. We are in times of deep crisis. And we're called to share in Joseph's mission now, here in the present. Particularly families. Families have a mission by modelling their life on the Holy Family. They have a mission to guard, to reverence and communicate love in a world that's forgetting love. In a world that says love is whatever you can make it, through faithful families being obedient to God's plan for marriage, God's plan for the family, they'll be shining lights. Persecuted, made fun of, but they'll be shining lights for the world. Workers, people who work as Christians, not work with money as their God, but work with Christ as their God and money flowing after that, money being down on the list, they will be shining lights. Joseph's vulnerability and obedience in the past, in the present, and to conclude now in the future. What is our ultimate human vulnerability? death. Death is our ultimate human vulnerability. We try and extend life. We try and live for as long as we can. Life expectancy is growing. Most people think that things are all right. You know, the majority of people are doing all right. Humanity can fall into the trap of feeling we're self-sufficient. And just when humanity thinks we're self-sufficient, that we can make happiness ourselves, you remember death. That's the one hurdle, the one obstacle, the one crisis that human power does not have the ability to outfox. Death is the great equalizing vulnerability of humanity. Death is perhaps the strongest reminder that we are creatures. Perhaps the strongest reminder that we're dependent. That jumping that hurdle is beyond our power. Death involves struggle. Death involves suffering. It's a bitter trial. And particularly for the faithful Christian, there will be particular temptations around the moment of death. The devil having his last hurrah, trying to get us to undo a life of faithfulness and love. Death is a lonely and helpless experience. No matter how much family we have around us, we still ultimately go through it alone. And it's a humiliation in the sense of the word that it reminds us of who we truly are. But Saint Joseph is the patron of a happy death. He teaches us 
vulnerability and obedience in the future. Whether that be tonight, whether that be next week, or whether it be in 50 years. St. Joseph teaches us how to live obediently in that vulnerable state. He shows us obedience and faithfulness in our greatest vulnerability. St. Joseph gave his whole life, gave it all up for Mary and Jesus. And he died enjoying the consolation of dying in their arms, holding the hands of Mary and Jesus. Can you think and imagine the words of encouragement that they would have given him? how consoling their words and their presence would have been in that moment for St. Joseph. He would have been going through incredible suffering, most probably knowing that Jesus was going to go to the cross and knowing that Mary would have to stand and witness that as well. But those faithful, loving, consoling words from Jesus and his blessed mother would have been a great gift to St. Joseph in those final hours. Would have helped him to accept death in loving submission and obedience. Death as a crown of his whole virtuous life. Dying as he lived. The word happy in patron of a happy death should not deceive us shouldn't deceive us. It's not like it's an enjoyable experience. It's not like it's all great. But when lived with faith and hope, there is a peace and a deep joy. And that's what we're talking about with a happy death. I'm sure Father Danny, on the deathbed of people, has seen that as well. I'm sure many of us have seen that perhaps in our families. For me, they are the most touching, most beautiful and most profound moments of my priesthood. To see somebody who has lived a constant life of faith, hope and love and then to faithfully accept death, trusting in God, knowing the promise he has for them is the most beautiful fruit in the most difficult trial. St. Joseph, patron of a happy death. St. Paul says to us, if we live with Christ, if we die with Christ, sorry, we will live with him. Our physical dying with Christ began the moment of our baptism when we were buried with him in the waters and physical death completes that process. And we hope, we hope to follow St. Joseph's example in living that as well. And particularly... In this year, another difficulty, another struggle we're going to face is most probably in New South Wales, there'll be a bill introduced to have euthanasia begun in New South Wales. A time where society and culture thinks that that moment, God isn't there. At that moment, life is irredeemable. At that moment, there's nothing good that can come from it. St. Joseph, the patron of a happy death, teaches us something different. Teaches us that even those moments are most precious to God. Even in those vulnerable moments, our obedience brings God's plan to fruition. We conclude by praying to St. Joseph. To you, O blessed Joseph, do we come in our afflictions, having always implored the help of your most holy spouse, we confidently invoke your patronage also. Through that charity which bound you to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God, and through the paternal love with which you embrace the child Jesus, we we humbly beg you graciously to regard the inheritance which Jesus Christ has purchased with his blood and with your power and strength to aid us in our necessities. O most watchful guardian of the Holy Family, defend the chosen children of Jesus Christ, 
O most loving Father, ward off from us every contagion of error and corrupting influence. O our most mighty protector, be kind to us and from heaven assist us in our struggle with the power of darkness. As once you rescued the child Jesus from deadly peril, so now protect God's holy church from the snares of the enemy and from all adversity. Shield too each one of us by your constant protection so that supported by your example and your aid, we may be able to live piously, to die in holiness and to obtain eternal happiness in heaven. Amen. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, keep us a happy and holy family always. Thank you so much, Father Ronnie. Um, I think, and I'm sure that everyone has got something out of this, this beautiful talk, this well-prepared um, talk about St. Joseph, past, present, and future, um, that we can apply in, in our own lives and in this world that we are living in today. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone noticed before, before we began, we prayed that we're gonna say, we're gonna bring Father Ronnie back um, to the Maronite Church, and I don't know if you noticed, but he said, um, we are unique in our, in our Maronite Church. Um, so, Father Ronnie, that's on, it's, re it's recorded, um, it's been live streamed, um, it's there forever that you have said that, so, and, I'm, and I'm praying that um, Archbishop Fisher has, has also heard this. So, um, thanks be to God, St. Joseph is already interceding <laughs> for us. Once again, thank you so much. I'm gonna, I'd like to call up um, who's here from our CAF team. Um, maybe Chris, if you can come up. And Cheryl, you're live streaming. Annalise, you can represent. <laughs> Annalise and Chris, please, if you can just come up for one second. And we've just prepared something very small for you, Father Ronnie, just as a token of our appreciation in this year of St. Joseph. And um, you mentioned the sleeping St. Joseph, so I think you already have one. You were saying to me you have in your car, but you've got a second one. <laughs> And uh, you're welcome anytime here at St. Joseph's, Father Ronnie. Um, we're going to take a photo um, with Father Ronnie. So I'm going to ask everyone to please come up um, to the front of the church. And afterwards, so when we finish from here, everyone is invited downstairs to share in um, a light supper. And if you'd like to ask Father Ronnie Marie any questions downstairs, then you're, you're more than welcome to. So please join us. Don't leave um, as we continue our feast celebrations. Um, tomorrow we have a Mass for Faith and Light. Don't forget the barbecue on uh, Saturday. And don't forget the concert also, especially on Tuesday at 8 p.m. And, of course, the, the solemn Mass on Thursday at 7 p.m. So may God bless you. Let's take a photo. <laughs> 